Good evening. My name is Alfredo Saadfile. I'll be uh, chairing this um, session. This is um, a seminar uh, in the uh, seminar series of the SOAS Department of Development Studies, uh, jointly organized with the Bloomsbury Doctoral Training Center for the Social Sciences, and this particular session uh, co-organized with the SOAS Department of um, Economics. We're very, very happy, very honored, thrilled to have with us Professor Mariana Matsukato, um, who uh, will be uh, leading this uh, session. Professor Matsukato is R.M. Phillips, a professor of the uh, Economics of Innovation at SPRU uh, at the University of Sussex. She's the author of a number of academic pieces. Uh, in particular, I'm going to mention the recent book, uh, The Entrepreneurial State, Debunking Public Versus Private Sector Myths. This book was on the 2013 Books of the Year list of the Financial Times, of the Financial Times, and it focuses on the need to develop new frameworks to understand the role of the state in economic growth. Uh, Professor Matsukato is the winner of the 2014 New Statesman uh, Sperry Prize in Political Economy, and in 2013, the New Republic called her one of the three most important thinkers in the world uh, in the field of innovation. She is a member of the um, Council of Economic Advisors of the Scottish uh, Government. Uh, she's a member of the World Economic Forum's uh, Council on Economics of Innovation, a permanent member of the European Commission's expert group on uh, innovation for growth, and very important to me, uh, at least a member of the UK Labour Party uh, Economic um, economic Advisory Committee, so working very closely with um, the uh, party leadership. She has held um, academic positions at the University of Denver, at London Business School, at the Open University, and at Bocconi University in uh, Milan. And uh, Mariana's research focuses primarily on the relationship between financial markets, innovation, and economic growth. This will be a fantastic opportunity for us to hear one of the world's greatest specialists in industrial policy uh, and in the economics of innovation. Just to uh, advertise this, if you want to tweet, and I, if you do tweet, which I don't, but if you do, please uh, <laughs> do. use hashtag SOASDevStudies or hashtag ESRC uh, to tweet about this uh, session. Next week, next Tuesday, on the 26th of January, we'll have Professor Uma Kothari uh, from the University of Manchester, and the topic of her talk will be popular representations of development, creating global alliances or reproducing inequalities. Five o'clock, five o'clock in room G3 in the main building. So thanks very much, Mariana. So thank you, Alfredo, and thank you for everyone for coming. Apparently, there is a, another event, which was hoping to have many of you there at the Greenwich uh, Political Economy launch. So they told me that they thought this was a conspiracy uh, to get you to come here instead of there, and I hope that's not true. Um, anyway, so I'm really happy, actually, that this is being co-hosted by Economics and Development Studies, because, in fact, innovation is, of course, a key uh, aspect of development, but unfortunately, the economics of innovation and some of the policy areas around it have actually not impacted as much as they could have. I think not just economic theory, but the challenges to economic theory and how we think about economic policy. And so, so many of the insights that I'm going to be trying to convey really come from thinking about innovation seriously, so how firms differentiate themselves through that process, why they require patient, long-term committed capital, what do we actually know about where this patient finance comes from, but really what does all this mean for economic policy. Um, and I think this is a great time to be talking about what we'll be talking about, because after, of course, the financial crisis, the need for growth, this desperate thirst for growth in so many countries actually became a bit more of a sensible conversation. So it wasn't growth for growth's sake, if you want, but a particular type of growth, because we know how the growth that we had, for example, in the 1990s was problematic because, amongst other things, it increased uh, inequality instead of decreasing it. But this need for, and these sound like really trendy words, right, for smart growth, so more innovation-led, 
more sustainable growth, which doesn't only mean green, but for now let's just pretend that means green growth, and inclusive growth, so you know, less inequality, really requires all sorts of thinking, new thinking about policy making in the economy, and, and this is really a great opportunity. Having said that, it's also a very depressing time I think we live in, and I really want to be addressing this depression. In fact, I'm often, uh, 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 I often say that I walk in to policy making venues and different ministries around the world as an economist and I come out as a life coach because of this depression that I think does characterize uh, uh, policy makers around the world where the way we talk about the role of public policy and of government is extremely problematic. It's always been problematic, but it's particularly problematic, I think, in the era we're living in. And at best, we hear the need for uh, policy to, if you want, level the playing field, or in my particular area, which is innovation policy, to create these fantastic framework conditions, you know, the conditions for innovation, invest in a bit of infrastructure here and there, science here and there, the skills gap, and of course, that requires all sorts of training programs but then get the hell out of the way so the really cool things can happen. And of course, where do the cool, dynamic, creative things happen? In business, right? So this portrayal of government as yes needed, but at best simply to fix different problems and create these background conditions and then get the, you know, get out of the way. And of course, in economics, we have particular ways we talk about this, and so this need to fix different types of uh, market failures, which I won't go into all of these, but the most classic one, again, in my domain, which is innovation, is of course the whole problem around uh, basic research and blue sky research that, of course, few uh, firms will invest in it. Uh, because it's so hard to appropriate the returns from an area like basic research that has such high spillovers, and so you have underinvestment, and so you need government to come in with a bandage uh, and fix that problem and invest in some science. And of course, many countries don't invest enough in science, but if you want, if you actually look at all these different areas and different types of market failures, one of the key things that I want to convince you about is that even if we did fix all these failures, it would be very hard to describe what has actually happened historically in places that have really tried to actively, strategically, uh, courageously, in a mission-oriented way, if you want, even tackle any of these problems, whether it be innovation-led growth, inclusive growth, or uh, green growth. And really, the key problem, sorry, this is hard because this needs to be out in order for me to click, but if it's out, I'm not close to the microphone, so I need to find a balance. Um, so the key problem is that actually what has happened in places like Silicon Valley, but I would argue China today, and there's obviously lots of very interesting things happening in China, uh, for sure in the parts of Germany that everyone always brags about as being so interesting for industrial policy, or Brazil up until a year ago before the whole stalemate, what actually was required and what we also witnessed by different types of uh, uh, policy making. And when I use the state, by the way, don't think of this as top down. I'm literally gonna be using the word the state or government or public sector in a pretty sloppy way, and I'll define it a bit better in a minute, but literally think of any sort of strategic public sector agency, whether it be the Department of Education, DARPA, or the BBC, and I'll come back to that later. Anyway, what that has actually entailed is active market shaping, market making, which in economics, unfortunately, we have very little vocabulary to talk about. So I'm, I'm sure most of you know the work of Carl Polanyi, the great transformation, and the reason I think this work is so powerful and yet hasn't really had any impact in the sort of mainstream way that policymakers think about um, their role is that you know, he was very explicit about even the market itself as having been actively, if you want, an outcome of this kind of market shaping uh, process from policymaking. So the market, the capitalist market, which is the national market, right, to be differentiated from, say, the local or international market, is a recent phenomenon, 300 years, emerges with capitalism, and it was forced into existence. This is you know, one of the great uh, insights from his book, 
Um, and that, that understanding of markets as outcomes of interactions between different types of agents, different types of public sector, different types of private sector agents, as well as, say, pressure from civil society, really requires also a very different framework than for policy, because markets as outcomes means we need to be thinking of what kind of outcomes we want versus having the market here and thinking of policy as just sort of inter, you know, different types of interventions, whether it's regulating, or, or fixing different types of market failures. I think in Keynes himself, there was actually lots of really interesting things that he wrote that also allude to this. The role of policy is doing really big things and not just tinkering on the edges. I think what has also happened, and hopefully we'll have maybe some time to talk about this, in modern day, if, if you want to bastardize Keynesianism, is that unfortunately it's also been interpreted, it's simply different types of stimulus to get us out of difficult periods, so recessions, with very little understanding of some sort of role of the state even in the boom. And I hope, again, that we can uh, 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 come back to this later because many of the different types of investments and, and policies that I'll be talking about actually happened in the good times. Uh, so the need to really have a theory of public policy even independent of the business cycle, because we all know, of course, what should be happening in the bust, right? Counter-cyclical government. Um, uh, but that's not enough. Um, and so, sorry for this completely self-promotional slide, but I have to say, one, I've never had my work translated in different languages before. The first time it ever happened was with this book, so I like to brag about it. But the main thing is when your book is translated into German as Das Kapital, it's actually quite cool to see it. I mean, it's never going to happen again. It'll never happen again. Anyway, so what I tried to do in this book that Alfredo mentioned and which um, uh, is listed here in its different translations was, in fact, to really take Polanyi's understanding of this market shaping process and really use it to describe uh, modern day, if you want, uh, areas that, are, that we talk about as somehow have, you know, really coming, have come out of entrepreneurial uh, dynamism and, and, and market making processes and really uh, uh, try to understand them better historically and then to reflect on what does that actually mean then for our inability today to even think seriously about public policy. And really the core point also is, comes back to this economist quote that I put at the beginning, this notion that somehow the revolutionary interesting things are in business and government is simply needed to present these, to create these framework background conditions and to correct these different types of market failures. What I try to do is really debunk that by showing how actually what we have always required in order to achieve any sort of interesting growth has been to have revolutionary, crazy, thinking out of the box uh, kinds of government. So the kind of Kafka guy is more interesting and dynamic than the, say, Zuckerberg guy. Of course, the point will not be a versus, but in order to build the kinds of public-private partnerships that everyone likes to talk about, or these cool ecosystems that, you know, it's, it's trendy words in government, we actually need a theory of the public sector. And it's very hard, even for the private sector, to engage with new challenges of the future unless it has that if you want strategic, uh, what I'll be calling mission-oriented public counterpart. Um, so both lose out. I'm gonna be coming to this slide at the end. I just wanna put it here so you know it's coming. I think sometimes it's useful to know what the hell is she building up towards. Uh, Cause I, you know, I did pitch this as rethinking economic policy and I wanna sort of arrive to this, which is that I hope that what I'll be talking about will enable us to really think about uh, directionality in the public sector. So, you know, growth itself doesn't have just a rate, it has a direction, and I know you recently had here Andy Sterling, who's really one of the most interesting people also thinking about this. So multiple pathways within particular areas. Um, how do we evaluate uh, public policy when it's not just fixing market failures? How do we build organizations in the public sector, whether it be, again, the BBC or a particular agency in the Department of Defense or an education agency that actually welcomes the trial and error explorative process and how do we, and this perhaps is one of the most important points, if we want a more just society, make sure that um, this necessary risk taking, which I'll be talking about, ends up not just sharing the risks but also the rewards. And I hope this also helps us rethink what we mean by, if you want, the redistribution uh, issue, which is, uh, I know that people like Hacker have talked about pre-distribution, but this is sort of going uh, beyond that, which is when we have a completely different theory of the role of the public sector in the wealth creation process itself, 
um, as opposed to just redistributing wealth, then it really should help us uh, make sure that we also reach uh, more inclusive growth because the distribution of the rewards should be proportional to this collective, if you want, risk taking, which occurs. Anyway, so let me uh, try not to take too much time. I'm gonna speed through some of this and actually go through in quite more detail other bits. Um, and so the first thing is, you know, the whole kind of smart innovation-led growth agenda, which is really central because I think many different types of economists agree that innovation itself has been a, a key feature, if you want, of what has allowed capitalism over the last 100, 150 years or more, but really as a result of public policy more recently, uh, achieve, if you want, the productivity enhance enhancements and rising living standards of, uh, uh, on average, even though since the 80s we know also what's been happening there, which again, uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk about. Um, but innovation obviously is a central motor of development, structural change, transformational change in capitalism, so we really have to understand that process and again, understand the role of the public and the private sector in that. Um, and of course, the key point here is that you know, not all technological changes are equivalent, and we have this notion of general purpose technologies as being really important ones which actually have affected uh, production and distribution across many different sectors. Well, what do we know about what actually allowed these major radical revolutionary changes to occur? And the first thing is that the kind of um, public intervention absolutely went beyond the market failure narrative of fixing the public good science problem. Okay, so the kind of intervention that happened, and forgive me if I focus a lot on the US, but this is because unfortunately places like Silicon Valley continue to be tried to copy, if you want, by different parts of the world, and because they don't understand it, they end up creating all sorts of problems. So, under, so I'll be focusing quite a bit on the US model, but I wanna go beyond that towards the end. So anyway, so in the US, you would not have had Silicon Valley had the public intervention just been upstream and basic research. There was all sorts of different agencies of which some I've put here in orange, uh, which, had, which intervened in the applied research process, but even in the financing of the early stage high risk uh, a company formation process through agencies like the Small Business Innovation Research Program. Uh, so these, there's many more. Uh, a great book by Fred Block and Matthew Keller also looks at, I think, something like 17 different agencies that have been quite important, but these are the National Science Foundation, DARPA, which of course was very important for the internet, the National Institutes of Health, ARPA-E, which today in the Department of Energy is trying to be the sister of DARPA in the Department of Defense, um, NASA, et cetera, et cetera. But what's very important here is understanding that this intervention absolutely went across that entire a chain, and also, if you just even look at any of the websites of these organizations, they're quite uh, explicit that they were, that their function, their, their very existence is meant to actively create new landscapes rather than just to fix different types of problems in existing areas. So whether it's NASA, ARPA-E, or the NIH, or even I put at the end there, the German public bank, uh, KFW because it's having a very important role today in the green emergence of the green, um, uh, if you want, green technology. Um, you know, it's it's they're very explicit that they're not there just to incentivize, facilitate, regulate, administer. It's very much investing in new areas um, and even coming up with the idea. So the National Nanotech Initiative, for example, actually partly was responsible for the very word nanotechnology. Uh, and the business sector came in later. Um, so I'll just show you some, some numbers here. This actually comes from the work of Block and Keller, where what's interesting here, of course, is that this kind of intervention downstream that I mentioned, which is harder to justify, um, in terms of actually providing the money itself to companies that are chosen, they're picked, right? Think of the whole picking winners uh, debate. So companies like uh, Compaq and Intel, Apple itself, but through an SBIC, not SBIR program, receive some early stage uh, patient, long-term committed capital through this particular program, SBIR, in the same way that, say, in Israel, uh, many of the uh, high-tech companies have gotten money from Yasma, which is a public venture capital fund. And if anything, over time, this, this graph here shows you the difference between private venture capital funding, funding, which should be supplying that early stage risk, along with, say, the business angels, 
and this public sector money. If anything, that difference has increased. Why? Well, if you know anything about venture capital, you'll know it's very exit driven. They want that exit to happen in three or five years through a buyout or an IPO when actually what this innovation process requires, even the death, famous Death Valley phase is you know, patience even in 10 to 15 years. So long-term patient finance. And this is actually quite important because still today we keep hearing that there's not enough finance out there for, for companies that want to do interesting things. And actually that's not true. There's plenty of finance. There's not enough of this patient long-term committed finance. And because innovation requires that, it shouldn't be that surprising that uh, you end up having these public, if you want, agencies around the world having to provide it. Uh, in the book, and I think this is the only reason it, it was translated in so many <laughs> languages, I kind of unpack the whole iPhone issue, which is that you know, this is the symbolic product of uh, you know, Silicon Valley, and actually you know, what makes a smartphone smart is what's inside it and what allows you to do smart things with it and not stupid things. So whether it's surfing the internet, which is publicly funded, knowing where you are with GPS, which is publicly funded, uh, using touchscreen display, publicly funded, and even the Siri voice activated system. They were all publicly financed. And of course, this does not mean that you know, the Steve Jobs phenomena, Apple, et cetera, weren't important. Of course, they were, and there's that great movie out there on that, but we don't actually have a way to describe uh, you know, what actually happened there, because what happened was that you had existing technology, which had been financed directly from different types of public sector institutions, which were then put together in really cool ways by, in this particular case, Steve Jobs, but the fact that an 800 book on him doesn't have one page, one paragraph, one sentence, one little word on any of this public money is really sort of the thing that I'm after and asking, what does that mean you know, in terms of our inability to describe the role of the public sector in this wealth creation process, in this emblematic you know, product like the iPhone? What does that mean for our uh, future ability to even produce those kinds of technologies, which the future Steve Jobs is of this world will require? Um, and I'll be getting to that more towards the end. Uh, when you look at the actual organizations, it looks scary, and most people say, oh, yeah, fine, you're just talking about the military industrial complex, and that's all the Cold War stuff, blah, blah, blah. That's partly true, and in fact, in this particular case, it is true, right? Just look at the names there, and, and it should start scaring you if it doesn't. So the CIA was absolutely important for the touchscreen display. The CIA, by the way, has one of the biggest venture capital funds in the world called InQtel, which very few people know about. But anyway, so what's interesting really about the story though is how it was then emulated in different sectors. So it's simply not true that this is just a military industrial complex. So in the health sector, uh, the National Institutes of Health, uh, which have been absolutely fundamental for even allowing the biotechnology sector to emerge, um, was very much a product of this very uh, obvious types of public investment, which literally looks like a wave, and it's a wave that the whole biotech industry in fact surfed, or more particularly the venture capital industry surfed, uh, because they came in about uh, in the 80s, if you want, after decades of this kind of public finance. Um, and all these types of investments are direct. Okay, they're not indirect. These are not about incentivizing or de-risking or just leveraging the private sector. So what's interesting is you can compare different countries, not just in terms of the kind of public support that, say, innovation or any area receives, but also whether it's direct or indirect. And there's many countries, um, including, I'd say, increasingly in some ways, the UK, which think that it's enough simply to create things like R&D tax credits. Um, and so the gray lines here are indirect uh, support, the blue line is direct support. And in fact, what we know is that those countries, like Canada, for example, that rely too much on just the blue, uh, so indirect measures through things like R&D tax credits, have a problem because what actually, uh, what actually motivates investors or literally entrepreneurs to invest is not something like tax or just making something cheaper. Right? It's, it's actually the perception of where the future growth opportunities are. And in fact, this was, I think, Keynes's point when he was talking about animal spirits, which unfortunately, as a concept, ended up getting hijacked by behavioral finance or behavioral economics. What Keynes's point there with animal spirits wasn't just the herd effects, the bandwagon effects, and the whole beauty contest stuff he talks about, but actually that what drives business investment in anything, in some ways, the long-run business investment, is really this perception of future opportunities, which yes, then are subject to all sorts of expectations, and within that you might start copying what other people are doing, but it's very important 
policy-wise, if you want to understand that, if you want something like the green economy or you know, the, the tech city kind of thing that they're trying to uh, form here in the UK, you actually have to first directly, if you want, form these new opportunities, which the business sector can see. And then on top of that, you might apply a really smart tax incentive. And by the way, there's some really stupid tax incentives. Uh, it doesn't make any sense in the R&D tax credit example to focus on the income generated from the R&D. Uh, you really should be focusing on the, if you want labor that, that produces that R&D, and so some tax credits do focus on that. But regardless of whether we're talking about smart or stupid ones, tax credits, the point is that tax credits or tax incentives or facilitation measures of this sort on their own have almost no evidence of producing uh, any net investment over time. And in fact, it's interesting to compare countries that have high business R&D spending with ones that have low business R&D spending, uh, a statistic we call BIRD, business R&D spending over GDP. And it turns out that those countries that have the highest levels are ones that also are characterized by the most direct public investments, which create, if you want, those animal spirits, which then can be facilitated on the marginal decisions with some sort of a incentive. Um, OK? Um, and, and I always put up this quote because I just think it's so good and, and probably not well known enough. And I think, again, this is what uh, Keynes uh, also was getting at when he was talking to Roosevelt, mm, Franklin Roosevelt, in this particular private letter at the end of the 1930s, where he's like, you know what, we, we, we actually have a greater problem than, we, than we've admitted because you know, this word animal spirits makes you think about lions, wolves, and tigers. But actually, what we often have in the business community are domesticated animals. So not tigers, wolves, or lions, but gerbils and hamsters and little pussycats. Um, and hence, the pussycat and the, and the tiger that I put on my book, which actually just requires a completely different type of policy making. And again, this is an area that I think has been ignored. It's a quote that's been ignored because it really presents us with two different, if you want, policy scenarios. One is a cage with a lion in it and the role of the policymaker as just taking away all the different impediments that might be red tape, you know, leveling the playing field by you know, reforming the tax system, et cetera, et cetera, versus a cage with a little pussycat in there, a domesticated animal, where the policymaking process is to actually to first get that little kitten to grow up into a big lion and even want to roar, okay? So in Italy, where I'm from, to, well, I'm not from Italy today, but I'm, I'm from Italy, and today the center-left government is focusing, focusing all its energies just on the impediment problem, as though the Italian problem were just one of bureaucracy, red tape, nepotism, mafia, and taxes. You know, obviously there's huge problems in the Italian bureaucracy, but those policies will have no effect on Italian growth unless they're complemented by uh, this, if you want, building up of what I'll be talking about in terms of a strategic, mission-oriented public capacity, um, because it's not just about taking away, uh, it's not just about facilitating. I probably didn't say before, something that I mentioned I would say, which is that when I talk about the role of the state, it's a decentralized, if you want, uh, a, a decentralized network developmental state, but this issue of having lots of different agencies involved in this process is something that has been quite interesting. Um, so when you have countries, for example, like China, which I'll mention later today, have, a, for example, the China Development Bank, which is one big agency doing a lot of this financing across many different sectors, potentially, you know, that, that's a very different model from this one that I've been describing in Silicon Valley, where you have lots of different agencies distributed throughout the entire innovation chain, each and every one of them being quite mission-oriented, and also, because they're so mission-oriented, being able to attract very high-level talent. Okay, so this is a, a very key point, which is that there's a self-fulfilling prophecy where when you talk about the role of some of these public institutions as just fixing market failures, or lots of also this public bashing that we often hear, which is too much bureaucracy, let's cut these different agencies, let's reduce their ambitions, so why is the BBC making soap operas and doing you know, uh, all these things beyond documentaries on giraffes, let's restrain their, uh, their area. This has an effect on the kind of talent that these agencies over time are able to attract. So one of the interesting things at least in this US example, is that precisely because they have been mission-oriented, they've been able to attract literally Nobel Prize winners. And I'm not exaggerating. So for example, the Department of Energy up until 
uh, about six months ago, or a little bit more, nine months ago, was run by Steve Chu, a Nobel Prize winner in physics, who in 2009, with the whole ARA stimulus in the US, 800 billion stimulus, the Department of Energy set up ARPA-E, um, which was then directed by Arun Majumdar, who later ended up directing Google's energy program. It's not a coincidence that these you know, bold uh, uh, thinking uh, agencies like ARPA-E or the DARPAs are able to attract that kind of talent. And it's not a coincidence of the opposite that when you have these agencies in countries that, to be honest, like the UK, that are uh, constantly being uh, also told to step back. If you go to the Business Innovation and Skills Department in this country, outside it says, uh, uh, Britain is open for business lowest tax, lowest regulation, you know, that's not necessarily going to you know, motivate if you want very high level scientists to go direct those kinds of agencies because it's simply not that interesting as a, as a motivating mission. Anyway, so sustainable growth, I'm going to be brief here just to say that what we're seeing today happen in green is not that different from what we've seen happen in biotech, in IT, in nanotech. In other words, uh, most of the capital intensive areas that are also characterized by very high risk and uncertainty, and it's really the uncertainty word that matters the most, right? So both Knight and Keynes constantly talked about the difference between risk and uncertainty with innovation really being a perfect example of uncertainty which you cannot build a, a probability distribution around uh, or devoid, if you want, of private capital at least in the in particular phases where there is so much risk. And so it's not a coincidence that you have for example, the role of public banks uh, playing a very important role also in the deployment diffusion process because when I talk about innovation, you shouldn't think just of the, again, R&D process. This is that whole chain I mentioned, but including the deployment and diffusion and what we see in uh, the climate finance landscape, if you want, is basically four public banks absolutely playing a leading role uh, way beyond what any private equity, venture capital, stock market, or corporate money, or even private utilities are paying. And that's basically the, the Chinese bank that I mentioned, the China Development Bank, the KFW in Germany, the Brazilian Development Bank up until recently when it had to basically stop much of what it was doing because of the political crisis, and the European Investment Bank. And we simply don't have ways to talk about this. Why? Because just look at this funding here of the KFW, which is the German public bank. Um, what this bank does, which we do know how to talk about, is that it's very counter-cyclical, right? So after the crisis, after 2007, it did exactly the opposite of what the entire private financial sector did, which is it increased, as opposed to decreased its uh, disbursements. Um, so counter-cyclical. But on top of that, it absolutely chose, it picked, if you want a direction, um, it picked this energy vent direction, which the government basically set for it and, and many other public agencies, where green was seen not just in terms of renewable energy, but also, but also as a complete new direction for the entire economy. And the KFW was part of that. This kind of uh, uh, investment, which is, again, not just counter-cyclical, but choosing a particular area and really kind of you know, uh, uh, tilting the playing field, not leveling the playing field, in that area across the board is something that we often in the policy making world and definitely in the economic theory world feel uncomfortable with, right? Because this is the classic kind of picking winners problem. No, 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 no. All you should do is level the playing field, create those conditions, lend to SMEs, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, spray finance everywhere and somehow the market will decide where it goes. Uh, this is absolutely not what, what we see with these public banks which are choosing. Even more so if you look at the Chinese numbers, which are absolutely astounding. This is from this great book, uh, which I really recommend people read if they're interested in uh, uh, the role of finance in the development process on the China Development Bank, a book called Changing the Rules of Finance, the CDB, by two Bloomberg uh, journalists. And the numbers, you know, literally to particular companies in you know, close to $10 billion going to individual companies, which looks crazy until you, again, go back to the Silicon Valley figures and just start adding up the numbers across agencies for particular companies or even for particular individuals. So Elon Musk, the new hero in Silicon Valley after uh, Steve Jobs died, we love to see him and talk about him and Tesla. Uh, Tesla and uh, SpaceX combined, which are his two main companies, received $5 billion, billion dollars from the U.S. government in different ways. 
um, through different types of direct support, including, you know, like these guaranteed loans, which energy companies have been receiving in the US. Most of you probably know the Solyndra loan, because it went bust, right? $500 billion lent to a solar company called Solyndra, which went bust, which everyone said, ah, this is exact, you know, this is the Concord, uh, uh, modern version of the Concord, which is government should not pick companies. Just spread that support, step back, don't give individual companies support. This is how Solyndra has been talked about, and the US taxpayer really pissed off that they had to bail out Solyndra. Uh, but Tesla received very similar amount of money, just a bit less. Uh, well, actually, it's a lot of money when you actually look at the numbers. But anyway, 465 million guaranteed loan. It was very successful. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is actually one of the issues which, which absolutely requires thinking about, which is that just like with private venture capital, any of these direct investments that I'm talking about, again, forget the subsidies and the incentives, these direct investments like a guaranteed loan to one company, Tesla, of course, is hugely risky. Most will fail. However, we you know, have then a hard time if you want following that logic because precisely because we admit that the venture capitalists are investing, we don't talk about the government as investing, we talk about the government as spending, again, de-risking, regulating, and playing this important you know, role of fixing different market failures, but we don't think of the government as investor, then we don't you know, sort of follow through and what would be the normal thing to follow through is, well, fine, think of it like a portfolio. Right? Just like any investor would. So you're going to do your Teslas, your Solyndras, you'll have some really high risk areas, some lower risk areas, and just make sure, unless you want to be completely foolish, that you get some of the upside from the successes to cover your inevitable downside losses. Okay, so I'll come back to this when I talk about inclusive growth. But all, the, the reason I mention it here is because you see this actually with the China Development Bank, you see it with the KFW, you see it with BNDS, a public bank, but precisely because they are public investment banks, they actually have thought through this process in terms of the portfolio, but this would be very interesting to think also across non-public bank, uh, public institutions, precisely because they too, including, again, literally the BBC, if you look at all the investments it's made, from the iPlayer to the BBC Micra, the big question is, is the tax system itself, or even the spillovers themselves that are created, enough in terms of bringing, bringing back a reward to these agencies to be able to do it again? which is what a venture capitalist wants to do, right? You don't just get the, it's not a one-time shot. You want to be able to get a revolving fund in order to repeat that investment process. Uh, anyway, some illuminated uh, businessmen absolutely understand this and admit that the government has to lead the way, uh, whereas others like Peter Thiel <laughs> uh, set up secessionist movements in uh, Silicon Valley in order to, you know, uh, uh, if you want, release the poor companies from this burdensome uh, presence of the government. But what's quite interesting is even uh, people like Bill Gates, who very clearly have recognized the role of government, especially during the COPS um, agreement in Paris, he was very clear, government must lead the way as it always has done in the IT revolution have been more hesitant to talk about some of the serious dysfunctions in the business community, including his own company. And this is where I come to the whole inclusive growth issue. And I, and I really wanna kind of argue that th these are all absolutely connected. And if we start treating them separately as innovation policy here, inclusive growth policy here, we absolutely miss the opportunity to bring them all together under if you want the umbrella of what's a new way to think about sort of wealth creation and how to, uh, 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 reg um, how do you say, um, think about that process. Okay, so uh, if we have a different way of thinking about who the risk takers are, and I've basically been arguing that the taxpayer has actually been one of the lead uh, risk takers, um, having said that, all my Minsky and friends always say, no, Mariana, stop talking about tax, because none of this stuff happened through tax. Uh, it happened through printing money. But anyway, let's not get into that too much now, because it brings all sorts of <laughs> complications. Um, uh, you know, it should then result in a different way to talk about also the distribution of the profits, if you want, that, that uh, result from this. So what's interesting, if you look at the Piketty you know, data, and this is just the data itself, it's not the return, of, return on capital, return on growth, but is that you know, from the 70s on, absolutely inequality starts to go back to the levels it was uh, before World War II. And he obviously talks about things like, oh, we need a wealth tax and all sorts of tax reform. What has been missed in that, if you want critique, the Piketty critique is really thinking, well, why 
did those taxes fall? Or why do we have such a dysfunctional tax system, which he then rightly wants to correct? And it has been absolutely connected to this problematic way that we have talked about the innovation process and the wealth creation process. In fact, in the US, um, in the US, the capital gains tax, for example, which Piketty actually focuses quite a bit on in, in, in one of his chapters, fell by 50% in just five years between 76 and 81. So fell from 40% to 20%. Why? Was it the tobacco lobbyists? Was it the oil guys, the big, rich, you know, fat net guys? No, it was the National Venture Capital Association that had just formed and basically made it its mission to get capital gains tax to fall with this narrative, you know, we're the wealth creators, we're the innovators. You want the knowledge economy, you want the information society, well then reduce our tax. And then you need a communist like Warren Buffett to tell us, uh, yeah, right, <laughs> you know, I didn't even look at capital gains, I invest where there's an opportunity. And in fact, if you look at where the VC industry invested, they absolutely, completely monotonically invested always where there was huge amounts of public money being spent. It, you know, taxes had almost no effect on where they invested. Of course, they had a massive effect on the profits they earned from those investments, but obviously the role of a policymaker is not to increase profits, but to stimulate growth. Um, now, it's very important, and, and Bill Lazonic and I wrote an article, where is it? Here it is, the risk-reward nexus and the innovation and equality relationship, where we, we begin with the characteristics of innovation, which we say are not just collective and extremely uncertain, but also cumulative. Now, if innovation was not cumulative, in some ways, these dynamics I'm talking about wouldn't matter. But because they all, you know, innovation is cumulative, path-dependent, persistent, then actually the returns from any of these investments take a long time. And unless you have a way of talking about who actually produced the integral under this curve of returns, what we have ended up allowing is for some agents, especially financial agents, to come in sort of halfway through and reap that, you know, a big chunk of that integral versus just their, mar you know, versus a return which is proportionate to their marginal contribution to that process. And I definitely would put the VC sector there. Um, but also all sorts of other agents, including the largest shareholders. And this is a, an, an area, obviously, that Bill Azonik, who I know spoke here recently, has contributed massively to, especially his most recent article in the Harvard Business Review, where he argues not just that these you know, very high levels of share buybacks, which are a proxy for financialization, they've gone out of whack, <laughs> you know, uh, three trillion over the last decade in the Fortune 500 companies, but the proportion with, uh, co compared to R&D spending, so actual investments in long-run growth has increased quite a bit. So this is the black line here, which is repurchases, so share buybacks, which boost stock prices, which boost stock options, which boosts executive pay over R&D is particularly problematic. Um, but also the whole justification for why this is fine, so shareholder value is actually built on this notion of that the, sh the, big, the shareholders as the risk takers. Right, so the residual claimant theory, so that everyone but the shareholders has a guaranteed rate of return, and when there's anything left over from this process, the residual, it's you know, the right that the shareholder uh, uh, can take it, the booty, because they in fact risk the most. Of course, that's completely false. And, and all the investments I've been talking about, for example, the public sector, of course, risked massively. And in the article, we also talk about how workers, of course, are risking constantly, for example, by accepting jobs for lower uh, salaries in the beginning, thinking they have a lifetime career in a place when actually, in most cases, they don't. Um, now, it, it, it is important to say that, uh, that Steve Jobs, uh, not Steve Jobs, sorry, Bill Gates figure I had up before is, is quite interesting because on the one hand, Bill Gates has been very proactive in arguing for more strategic government. For example, in, he leads the American Energy Industry Council and has argued that the government in the US should be spending more on things like ARPA-E, so an additional billion, he argued, when actually this council, which is made up of these seven companies led by Microsoft, uh, if anything, have been increasing their share buybacks and in just in, um, that 10 year period, which was the period uh, when they were arguing more should be spent, um, you know, they spent 237 billion on those areas. And when you ask these companies why they're doing that, why aren't they spending on, you know, on uh, human capital, R&D, blah, 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 and why so much if you want to share buybacks, often the answer is because there's no opportunities for investment. And so this is the right thing to do. 
And really the issue is, and through this, uh, 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 if you want, depiction that I've been portraying, is you have huge amounts of public money being spent on these future opportunities. And really what we don't have today is a proper deal, a healthy deal, a healthy public-private partnership, a symbiotic mutualistic partnership versus a parasitic one that can actually engage in what, you know, what should this deal be? Because we shouldn't forget that even though I've been talking about the state, the state, the public sector, the government, you know, this blah, 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 of course the private sector has always been important, but we know that. That's why you don't need me to come up here and tell you that. But it's been most important when these deals were struck. So one of the issues is today we don't have in the green area the kind of Xerox Park, Bell Labs kind of private big laboratories that we had for IT. And why is that? So where did Bell Labs actually come from? Was it just AT&T that one day woke up and said, I want to do innovation, right, big stuff? No, the government forced AT&T to do that. AT&T was a massive monopoly, and in exchange for this government-granted monopoly right, think of Google, Google today is a big monopoly and it's allowed to remain a, a big monopoly, uh, AT&T was forced to uh, uh, reinvest its profits, not just in the real economy, not just in innovation in its little area, but big innovation that could really affect the entire economy. And that's where Bell Labs came from, which was out of a provocation, uh, or, or if you want, a healthy uh, deal. And I think this is one of the issues. And so how do we build such deals? Well, there's all sorts of ways. The first thing is to admit that tax is no longer playing the role that it used to, because another communist, or not communist, uh, was Eisenhower, of course, right? He was a Republican, not even a Democrat, general, military general. And when NASA was founded, the upper marginal taxation rate was 91% in the US. In that era, this thinking about this whole risk return and also deal making between public and private was still relevant, but not as relevant as today. Again, we all know what's happened to capital gains, we know what's happened to corporate income tax, we know what's happened to the top marginal rate. Again, 91%, we're debating here 50% under a Republican president. So the real issue is how might we, if we admit that the role of the public sector has absolutely been to lead this entrepreneurial risk-taking investment process, structure up a more healthy deal? It could, of course, be done through equity, which is, in fact, what happens in some countries, like in Finland. They have Citra, which invested in Nokia, retained equity. Yasma in Israel retains equity or royalties. Um, we could use income contingent loans and just in, instead of these sort of giveaway loans which uh, are independent of the profits that are generated later from these uh, uh, companies. Don't forget that Google's algorithm was publicly financed through the National Science Foundation. So even with the grants, it could just be giveaway grant, here's money Google, go do your thing, Larry Brin or whoever. But you know what, if you make X billion from this, then maybe you know, something will come back to, whether it's an innovation fund or something else. Um, we could, of course, cap prices, which in fact is in the law in the United States. The Bay Dole Act allowed publicly funded research to be patented in 1982 in order to facilitate commercialization. And in that act, it actually said that the exchange, the deal, is that, well, obviously, the government has the right to cap the prices of those drugs medicines that are publicly financed. Never exercise that right. So even when it's in the law, where they foresee this problem that the taxpayer is paying twice, both for the research, which I showed you before is about 32 billion a year, um, and for these really high prices, it's not an active because government is scared to see, be seen as you know, too active in the market making process. Prices, no, that's, that's, that's the market. We at best can facilitate the emergence of these different um, uh, drugs. And don't forget that in the UK, where, where you have the uh, NHS, the prices are still, even though they're, they're somewhat negotiated, but they're still, to a large extent, uh, if you want, set by the pharmaceutical prices with the welfare state, then having to come in to subsidize that. Anyway, there's all sorts of other ways that this could uh, occur. And in the article with Bill, we argue we should also limit share buybacks, which is, hey, if you, Pfizer, or Amgen, or Cisco, are benefiting so much from public investment that you have to then promise to reinvest at least a certain percentage of your profits back into the production process itself instead of into these financialized measures. And let's not forget that today we have record level hoarding rates in both Europe and the US, so a lack of this kind of reinvestment. Um, and it's not enough to say there's no opportunities. What we really have is not a deal. We, we no longer have this healthy deal. So I'll end just by saying that in order to get this kind of inclusive uh, 
growth, it, we really need to really literally think of it as a revolving fund in the big sense that I've just been mentioning. But more in particular, coming back to these big four questions I put up in the beginning, we absolutely need a way to think about the policy making process as absolutely setting the direction for change. It, you know, get away from this whole picking winners, you know, question, which is an irrelevant question. Everything I've shown you today has been picked, whether it was, uh, uh, you know, the internet, GPS, but also shale gas. Shale gas was absolutely picked by the US Department of Energy for 40 years, and this massive effect it's having today on commodity prices uh, is an outcome of those choices having been made. And so really the question is, what can we learn from how these choices were made in the past and how they can be mission-oriented? So instead of focusing on particular sectors or just technologies, when you think of a big problem, like going to the moon, what was interesting of going to the moon is that about 14 different sectors got involved. And there was about 400 different homework problems underneath that. So if you want, you know, thinking of all these societal challenges, whether it's the aging crisis, climate change, et cetera, thinking about directionality in terms of, you know, honing in on these homework problems is quite important. Um, evaluating these investments is fundamental because even when you have these agencies that make these strategic investments, they're immediately accused of crowding out. And even when we talk about crowding in, at best, that's sort of at the macroeconomic level. So fine, you get the whole Keynesian stimulus, you get a multiplier effect that increases the pie of GDP, which increases the pot of savings, which increases the amount of money that private investors, blah, blah, blah. But, but that's not what I've been talking about. I've been talking about absolutely pushing the market frontier, creating a completely new landscape, which absolutely did not exist. And so what we should have, but we do not have, is concrete indicators through which we assess and value that, if you want, pushing of the market process. So you actually look at the distance that, if you want, the, the pushing of the market frontier. So in an area like health, we should not actually have the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, or in this country, if the, NIH, if the NHS was actually investing in innovation, which it doesn't really do, but of course the Medical Research Council does. It shouldn't just be, for example, financing most of the revolutionary drugs, which pharma doesn't, which they do, but why just drugs? Why not really push that market frontier into areas like lifestyle, which the pharmaceutical industry doesn't invest in, but instead of seeing it as fixing a market problem, absolutely shaping new markets and making sure that the way we value these agencies is precisely whether they've achieved that. Instead, we do the opposite. When an agency like the BBC organization goes out of its little remit of fixing the public good, which is like documentaries and quality news, et cetera, as soon as they start doing The Voice or soap operas or, uh, or, or, or whatever, we're, we, we see that as having gone out of their remit, potentially taking the, the space that should be for the private sector versus actually seeing these activities, if, if you want, as um, as activities that they're doing to produce, for example, different types of public value messages, the concept of social value and public value, regardless of the actual activity, documentary or soap opera, actually doesn't exist. By focusing just on the public good, as, as defined by economists, we, have, we are increasingly limiting the space within which the public sector is even allowed to act, and so this also then affects things like, I mentioned before, the ability to attract talent, because of course even the eye player would seem like out of the remit of the BBC. Instead, by constantly investing in-house in its own capabilities and competencies, rather than outsourcing all the interesting things to the private sector, this has actually enabled it, at least historically, to attract very high level talent. This is related to the whole issue of how do you build capacity in public organizations so they welcome this trial and error process, which inevitably will include failure. Uh, Hirschman talked about policy as process. This is extremely important in terms of allowing public sector organizations to build these dynamic versus static partnerships. And of course, this whole issue of how do we distribute not just the risks, uh, but also the rewards through these different mechanisms, which you don't even ask. You don't even get to this question unless you begin with saying that we absolutely require a different narrative and theory, and hence also valuation mechanisms which introduce this investment and risk-taking process. Um, and lastly, it took such a long time to make this graph when I did the TED Talk, so I always have to put it in to, to make <laughs> sure that it made sense to spend that time. But anyway, this is the, the Prezi stuff, which I've never done again. But you know, th rethinking this whole stupid cartoon image, which we are fed every single day, 
has to be the beginning, otherwise we just end up at the, at, at the starting point of just set the conditions and get the hell out of the way. And I've gone over time, sorry. <laughs> I'm done. Thank you so much, Mariana. This has been absolutely wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Very, very insightful and a real privilege to be here. Um, I will uh, ask Professor Ben Fine from the SARS Department of Economics to make some comments about uh, the talk uh, and perhaps um, leave some questions for us for discussion later on. And then I will open for uh, questions from the, from the floor. So you might want to think um, about your questions. But Ben, um, please. Okay, well, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent uh, talk. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I find there's very little to disagree with, and I don't understand how either any gerbil or tiger could disagree with you either. Um, I prepared a portfolio of responses in advance of the lecture, um, and uh, I will go over some of those, but I will have to uh, think on my feet. I think, in general, um, I would, as I've said, this is food and drink for tigers and gerbils. And uh, my own approach would be to involve some shift, possibly in emphasis, in framing, and in priorities. Um, I want to begin, though, by observing something of attention, which I think is addressed in, in the uh, presentation, which is to argue that state intervention has been and remains extensive and decisive in innovation, but that, that raises the question, why has it been a failure? Why have we had the global financial crisis? Why has there been this interruption in the success of the innovating capitalist economy? And Mariana and our task is to lift the veil on this um, in order to, as I understand it, to ensure that we get more of this uh, state intervention to promote an innovation. But one of the issues I want to raise is, well, why is that veil there in the first place? And what effect does it have? Two of my uh, portfolio of responses was to deal with that, first of all, in the area of scholarship. Why is it that economists are incapable of recognizing the nature of the sources of innovation, but I haven't got time for that, so I'll put that on one side. And the other one is uh, why economists who are engaging in arguing for a renewal of industrial policy remain incapable of understanding uh, what is uh, involved here. Uh, all of that I'll put on on one side because I haven't got time for that either. What I do want to say is that uh, uh, to use the vernacular, we've had 30 years or more of neoliberalism. This has witnessed unprecedented realization of technical change and innovation through the state and the private promotion, uh, which in the context of other global conditions, which I could run through, ought to have underpinned continuing expansion of uh, the global economy on an equally unprecedented scale, despite what was a slowdown in the uh, period after the uh, stagflation of the 1970s. I mean, the way I like to put this is that capitalists have had everything their own way, not just innovation, but almost everything else as well, but still they fucked it up. And the proximate cause of this, and I think Mariana does raise that, uh, not, not just in passing, is financialization. And of course, there's been a huge set of innovations within the financial sector itself, quite apart from weaponry, as well as other areas uh, that, that uh, Mariana correctly put to the, f put to the fore. Uh, one of the, uh, I think, striking and absolutely appropriate thing to say about neoliberalism, despite its ideology, is to bring out just how, le how highly interventionist it has been, including in the area of industrial policy, even if it, as I said, puts a 
a veil over that. Uh, but what strikes me here is that, in many ways, if the Keynesian post-war boom uh, had continued from the 1960s onwards, much of what um, Marianne is asking for would have been realized. Um, what we were witnessing throughout the post-war boom was a socialization of economic and social life as an ongoing trend delivering the sorts of uh, outcomes that she is seeking. In a sense, the only debate was between the social reformists and the social revolutionists. How do we keep this going? Is, will it be by continuing social democracy or by uh, a social revolution, which will be essential? In fact, both of them proved to be wrong. And what I would argue is the processes of socialization, and again, this is more a matter of emphasis than, than disagreement as far as I can see, the processes of socialization, not just of industrial policy, but almost every area of economic and social life have been undertaken by the financial sector. Um, that leads me to a, two points then of, of you know, bordering on the disagreement, perhaps. Um, the first is, and I put this very provocatively, if I had the choice, I would stop all innovation now um, and make best use of what we have already. Do we really want to discover, well, you, you did the moon, but I was going to do water on Mars. Do we really want to discover whether there has or is water on Mars when large numbers of our population don't even have water and sewage? I mean, we do not need innovation in technology to deliver these. Uh, quite apart from, don't we have the technologies? Yes, by all means, let's make them better and so on. Don't we have the technologies for clean, uh, renewal, sustainable delivery of energy and so on? So that's, that's one issue to raise. Really, should innovation of the sort that you've been talking about be at our forefront rather than uh, dealing with the problems that you raise again of inequality in the context of the technologies that we have already. It may not necessarily be a matter of either or, um, but that itself leads me to my last point, which is uh, your presentation very much rests within the framework of the agenda of the state versus market, which was uh, promoted by the Washington Consensus. This itself morphed into the state in support of the market with the post-Washington Consensus. Uh, and this gives, uh, uh, in my view, considerable leverage in terms of pro progressive thinking. But analytically, underpinning the state and market and interventionism is what I've called the P times two and the C times two. We have to have a look at the politics, and we have to have a look at power, and we have to have a look at conflict, and we have to have a look at class. And for me, really, to go back to a point I've raised already, uh, the major obstacle in all of these respects is not just the financialization of innovation, but also the financialization of economic and social life. To deal with, we have to put on the agenda before we can even start talking about alternatives uh, to uh, the uh, uh, limited development of innovation and delivery that you have so ably pointed to. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ben. I'll, uh, invite, yeah. I'll invite Mariana for a quick uh, response to Ben, uh, and then we'll go to, to uh, questions from the floor. Mariana. OK, yeah, maximum five minutes, he said. I just can't, for some reason, I can't get this. Oh, here we go, restart there. Five minutes, max. Okay. This works better. <laughs> so first, oh, first of all, thank you. I agree with everything you said, except I'll just give a different taint to it. It's, you began by saying, I don't see why any tiger or gerbil would disagree. Well, I'll, I'll tell you why there's disagreement. There's huge profits to be made by telling a very, very different story. So the mega profits that are made in the pharmaceutical industry, which remains the most profitable sector in the entire world, are obviously highly correlated with the prices that are being charged. And as soon as we talk about, again, where these wonderful products, whether they're innovative or not, have come from, then you know, 
that price that pricing should not be allowed, not because it's just unfair and not just because people are dying because they can't buy the drugs, but because it absolutely does not represent the contribution that those particular private actors made in that process. Of course, they were important, but they weren't the only ones. Uh, the capital gains example I gave you, billions were made <laughs> when capital gains fell by 50%, and it fell not just because some stupid person decided to allow it to fall, but because of this lobbying through this narrative of this whole wealth creation process. So it's absolutely fundamental to recognize that money is being made, at least in the short run, and, I'll get, and this brings me to your long run question actually, but in the short run, massive profits are made by telling a very different story from the one I've been telling. Um, now the long run story is very problematic for the companies themselves, and this is why the short, the gerbils and the tigers should be worrying, even though they might not worry in the short run, uh, in the long run, uh, because you know where do profits actually come from? Well, from these investments, and let's not get into the whole sort of Marxian view of how we would define the profits, but um, when you end up having extreme financialization, which has also been enabled by this lack of deal making that I've been mentioning, because again, the share buybacks of course could be limited if there was a deal between what the public sector has actually provided, not just in subsidies, but in terms of direct investments for these companies, including Cisco, that spends more than 100% of its net income on share buybacks, as well as the level of austerity that we're experiencing today, but actually the more structural austerity that we've experienced since the 1970s, which is, again, part and parcel of this whole process because it's really been the whole public choice theory revolution of Buchanan, et cetera, in the 1980s, which, which very directly went after this notion of you know, public value or social value as doing anything more the public sector doing anything more than, say, the public good, so really abolishing any notion of this grander project that one might have, um, including very specifically the market-making, market-shaping process, this hurts future right, investments of the kind I've been talking about. So actually, the US system today is under immense threat. Uh, these same agencies I've been talking about for the first time in their history, this is very interesting, for the first time in their history are facing cuts. Um, under Reagan, the, in, the investments in most of these programs actually doubled <laughs> uh, or, or increased um, in most cases, in some cases doubled. Uh, so this is the first time, and this is why I mentioned in the beginning, that we are living across the world, not just in the US. In fact, in Europe, it's much worse than the US, a real crisis of imagination of the public sector. This is why Tony Judd talked about it as a discursive crisis that we have with the public sector. Um, then also this whole thing about industrial policy, I have a real problem with it because industrial policy, which obviously I support because you know everything I've been talking about has been a result of industrial policy, but the revival of industrial policy is very problematic because it sees, sorry, and this is coming to your, your point about industrial policy, it kind of sets up the problem as big bad finance versus great industry. We need to rebalance the economy, this is how the UK at least talks about it, you know, from finance towards the makers, from the takers towards the makers, ignoring completely this issue about financialization, which which is that one of the biggest sicknesses we have today is the financialization of the real economy. And this is why absolutely innovation policy, unless accompanied by an extreme definancialization of the real economy, is just literally gonna make this ecosystem even more parasitic. Why should we have just more and more money coming out of the government going to uh, you know, the Pfizer's of this world when they then spend most of their profits just on these share buybacks? Um, I was going to say something about that, can I remember? Um, what else? Uh, yeah, so this thing about innovation, do we actually need innovation? I think you're, I partly agree with you, but I also you know, don't. And in other words, uh, but let me just focus on the easy part, because the other one would just bring us too much into uh, you know, what actually, you know, into productivity issues. But anyway, what, what I mean by mission-oriented innovation is precisely that. It's not for me to say what the mission should be, or what the, you know, or us even. It, it should absolutely be also part of a democratic debate. But what's interesting about the going to the moon experiment, you know, it was just a dream. It was kind of crazy. But first of all, it was crazy. It, it's when government was still able to be a bit crazy. Crazy. NASA's mission today is commercialization, right? Uh, this is, you know, like sex. Like when you can't get it up or whatever, you just start focusing on it, it ain't gonna happen, <laughs> right? So they're focusing on commercialization. You have you know, all these innovation policies focusing on innovation, disenabling, sorry, I'm these public the, agencies. I'm glad the woman said that, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so what green could be, but this is very important, so what green could be is a completely new direction for the entire economy, which is what the energy 
innovation uh, uh, plan is in Germany. The energy event policy is a new direction for the entire economy. And it's also on the demand pull side, right? So green becomes a direction even for IT in the same way that suburbanization became a direction for mass production. Because this is what I meant when I kept saying this is not just about R&D, it's not just about high tech, it's about First of all, thinking of that whole innovation process, but also on the demand side, that's where you have to have bold public policy steering these revolutions. So, you know, Robert Solo or, or Robert Gordon's whole thing about computers are everywhere, but in the productivity statistics, or the whole toilet thing versus the internet, which had more of an effect, right? So when you have to go outside to pee in the middle of the night, and then all of a sudden you can do it inside, you can bet that was much you know, that changed people's lives much more potentially than having the internet. This is one of the debates out there. But the point is, um, do, have we actually had for IT a direction in the way, again, that suburbanization supplied for mass production? And could that perhaps be one of the reasons why the IT revolution has not been fully deployed and diffused? And that is part of what we should be talking about when we talk about innovation policy. And that's why I focus so much on this word uh, directionality. Um, again, this whole other point of innovation, I mean, I, it's, you know, we would have unemployment unless you have investment in these areas that increase productivity over, um, but I don't want to get into the whole technological unemployment thing because I think that's been misguided by the whole skills issue. Skills are outcomes of investments. When you have financialization, you have a crisis also of that investment process, and so the skill uh, bias technological change completely misses the skills as an endogenous result of the investment process. And so I, I would just want to make sure that any discussion about technological unemployment actually took that into account, but again, that it just would open up a whole can of worms. So should we open it up to the floor? Wonderful. Th thanks very much. This is getting better and better. Yes. Uh, we've got two microphones. So um, what we're going to do, because we want to capture this uh, discussion on video, you raise a hand, I call you, there will be a microphone uh, coming your way, uh, and then you ask your question. Yes. So first one here. Yes. Hi, thanks for the um, fascinating talk. Uh, going back to, uh, my name is Ruth Caddy, I work with ActionAid and we've done a lot on tax. Uh, one of the things that we think about sometimes is that even if corporate tax avoidance was cancelled, still tax receipts of a lot of com countries would not be that high. So I was wondering, do you have any um, comment on what lessons your discussion have for countries that are resource poor, don't have a lot of revenue, don't have a lot of money to invest in these kind of new sectors. You've talked a lot about US, China, big, big mm -hmm. countries with lots of resources. But what about a much smaller, low-income country that may not have as many resources at their disposal? Thanks. OK. So but, uh, oh, do, do you mind if we collect a few questions? Yeah. It's because of the time constraint. Uh, yes. Yes. Hello, thank you very much for an interesting uh, talk. Um, I'm coming at this from, I do research about ICT hubs in Africa, and I get very frustrated with the myth of Silicon Valley within African tech hubs. And I have two questions. The first is, to what extent do researchers looking at this in the US kind of avoid the dangers of crony capitalism? Or to what extent do we have to be pragmatic that that's part and parcel of this process? Because when we move to places like African countries, that's used as a huge justification against industrial policy that crony capitalism is a thing. Um, and then the second question is to what extent, you know, I get very cynical with these startup competitions that in a sense it's, it's PR for Google and Microsoft and whoever else to justify certain things in African countries. Mm. And I'm wondering to what extent it's that government lacks a PR or a corporate social responsibility department to make their message. And to what extent is it about these companies having money to spend on their image and their mission? Thank you, yes. Sorry. In addition to what Ben said, what we have observed is a situation where it's not just the financial crisis, but also the greatest uh, worsening of 
income distribution for so many years at the very same time that all of these excellent and very impressive things are happening by the state. And one wonders if we could link these things or we should link these things. And I find fascinating that uh, at the moment there is a debate between, with, with what I would call the neo-left, that is totally mainstream economy. Some of them got a Nobel Prize in economics promoting neoliberalism or neoclassical economics in the past, that now take a view which read it, if I read it in the lights of the 70s, I might say it's actually very much in line with what we used to call the instrumental theory of the state. Mm -hmm. That is the idea that the state, in effect, is the executive committee of the bourgeoisie. And I wonder if these theoretical ideas can actually uh, make some link, because all of these things happening together, that is the state being so bloody good, so to speak, and then at the same time to have the crisis, to have the worsening distribution of income, all of these things, it seems to me like some winners are pitching losers and we are the losers, and those who are pitching the losers us is by pitching the, the, the mechanism that supports them to be winners, which is the public sector. So all of this mm -hmm. love of the left with the public sector needs to be seen in a slightly more cynical way today. Just, just one more, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and then we close this round. Yeah. Colleagues, um, to be brief, because we have a time. Yeah, question. really brief question. Um, you, you presented data on, on, on inequality and, and talked about inclusive growth. Um, what I, just a question on more global inequality and even development, um, and especially the argument that you said um, with uh, the direction argument and excluding picking winners. Um, so when we look at less developed countries, would that not be detrimental for their developmental outcome, given sort of what Ben also talked about, the neoliberal uh, return to the static, low productive, comparative advantage that's uh, uh, apparently naturally given um, um, for, for these less developed countries? And would that not be uh, then, as a result, the, them being stuck on the, on, the, on the lower end of the value chain? Or do we need to include uh, again, the picking winners in, in your direction arguments when we talk about less developed countries. Thank you. Um, Mariano, would you like to okay. respond? So, um, right, the first question, let me just break down the first question because there's two different parts of that question. One is a big country, sorry, where are you? So I can look at you there, sorry. Uh, big country, small country, and then sort of developed versus developing. And the first part is it's kind of irrelevant. I mean, there's plenty of massive big countries that are completely clueless in this area and small ones that are actually quite innovative and, and vice versa. So Denmark, I always take as an example. Denmark's tiny. It is the number one provider of high-tech services to China's green economy. And China's spending $1.7 trillion. So you know they did something right. And if you start looking at, and I can tell you the story of what actually happened in Denmark, which I don't have time now, but definitely the small, large thing is not the issue. In terms of the relevance for developing, I mean, obviously there, and I'm not an expert in low-income countries, but in terms of the middle-income countries, I mean, I always wonder, how did the BRICS word even get going? It actually means nothing. I mean, looking at you know Brazil, Russia, and India, and just how different they are, what's been interesting for me in, in looking at Brazil, specifically at the organizational level, um, is, is precisely that, that the interesting things, again, happen at the organizational level. So the particular things that BNDS has done and how it structured its investments and how it's been able to recruit talent was absolutely fundamental for at least a period or particular spaces, I don't wanna make a macroeconomic argument, but for its success. Um, which doesn't mean, you know, so, so the category public bank even doesn't necessarily mean much. So in Italy, we have a public bank, it's crap. It absolutely does, uh, the opposite of what I've been saying, which is, at best is counter-cyclical, and, it, and its investments are all about just leveraging, de-risking the private part, not really taking any courageous role in anything. So for me, really, the lesson is organizational lessons. What can we actually learn from looking at the BBC versus, say, a public broadcaster, even like I again, sorry to keep coming back to Italy as the, as the lame country, but the organizational lessons are massive, and I do think, at least for high-income and middle-income countries, it's been ignored. Um, now, again, the challenges for a very low-income country are different, and it is simply not my expertise, so I don't think I should even say anything. 
Um, crony capitalism is everywhere, again, and this is really where I can say Italy, uh, sorry. Uh, but what's interesting is it's the opposite. In other words, you, you know, even more crony capitalism when you don't have actually a theory of what the public sector should be doing. It's especially when the public sector sees its role, sorry, who asked the crony capitalism question? There you are. Um, when, when the public sector sees its role is just facilitating, you know, getting the right, you know, being business friendly, you know, that is like, and I'm gonna, I was about to say something really vulgar that Oscar Wilde said, but I won't. Um, so yeah, it, it opens you up to being, you know, beep, beep, beep. Um, and so in this country, for example, sorry, I keep being very improper. Um, this is my New York side, not the English side. It's my personal space. <laughs> so in, in the UK, which at least recently in its recent history has been very, uh, damning about the role of the state, just think of Cameron's famous quote in 2010, civil servants are the enemies of enterprise. This is the government that did one of the most crony things possible, which is to allow one company, GlaxoSmithKline, to lobby through the most idiotic innovation policy ever, which is the patent box. The patent box makes no sense. Anyone who knows anything about innovation has argued it makes no sense. Patents are already monopolies, right? For 20 years, you don't target the income that's generated from the patent, which is what this massive tax reduction does for uh, in, in the patent box policy. You target the income that's generated. Just in the UK, that's going to um, reduce um, uh, tax revenue by something like four to five billion pounds, which of course then is going to require you know cutting uh, whether it's education spending, social services, or whatever. This particular problematic. Uh, tax policy was absolutely lobbied through in a very crony capitalistic way. And it's, you know, this, and I would argue, I mean, just kind of jumping to Christos's kind of que uh, question about also the left and labor, labor has actually been one of the worst in this area. So it was actually the labor government that got lobbied and reduced uh, the time that, cap that private equity has to be invested from 10 years to two years in order to get to be eligible for this massive uh, tax reduction policy. And it's not a coincidence, sorry for, for just capital gains tax reduction, it's not a coincidence that when labor lost the last election in May, what did Tony Blair say? What did even my good friend Chuko Muna say? And uh, what was her name, who then didn't even make it? Uh, Kendall, Liz Kendall say, the day after uh, they lost? We lost because we didn't embrace the wealth creators, right? Business. And so that immediately got labor thinking, oh, we have to show we're business friendly, we're business friendly. This is the worst possible pressure that a party can feel, especially when in power, to be business friendly, because the, it's, it's precisely when, you know, because that's not the point of government to be business friendly. It's to do what Keynes said in that great quote I put up before, to really, you know, to be doing big things, not just tinkering on the edges, making things a little bit better, a little bit worse, but be doing the big things that the, that, that the private sector is not doing. And the fact we don't have a way to talk about these big things that the private sector is not doing unless we resort to this kind of lame market failure framework, which of course is important, but it simply doesn't describe probably anything more than 30% of what government actually needs to do to get us the kind of growth we want, then this really opens up government absolutely for this kind of crony uh, ca capitalist uh, uh, scenario. Um, the whole PR thing is is very interesting you mentioned that because I'm, I'm constantly arguing that government needs a marketing agency and you see this even you know for social policy so you know the whole Obamacare thing which was huge right I mean so many uh, presidents or first ladies in the case of Clinton it was Hillary Clinton that tried to get this uh, uh, health policy through uh, when Obama did it which was a great achievement you can almost see that as a mission right I mean huge achievement what he at least was trying to do obviously then got you know, watered down immensely, he had no way to talk about it. You know, so when he was accused of uh, meddling in people's health care, right, and that's where the whole thing starts sort of falling apart, um, he should have said, sorry, meddling? What? You know, we created your healthcare system, right? 75% of new molecular entities with priority rating in the US are financed from the National Institutes of Health. He didn't say that. So by completely changing the narrative of we are not just fixing the market, we're not just regulating, we're not just redistributing to make things more fair, but we have absolutely co-created the space you're calling the healthcare system. We're not just meddling, intervening, and making it more socially just is absolutely fundamental for their ability also then to talk about their rights to you know, whether it's capping the prices of drugs or uh, a forming a national health service, which the US, as well as many third world countries don't have. Um, 
Anyway, the whole value extraction thing that Christo said, I mean, I'm actually writing a new book just on that, on how so much value extraction occurs in the name of value creation, and this is what the left has completely not gotten. Um, and so I'm not gonna say more of that, otherwise you won't invite me back in a year to talk to you about that. Um, but the whole public choice, you know, uh, again, thing that I mentioned before, which basically kind of sets up government to just look like an inefficient private sector and then thinking of different efficiency reforms that we can enact has been one of the most dis disenabling uh, uh, things that have happened, I think, in the last 30 years. Um, I actually didn't understand the last question. So, uh, so global inequality, and the, I, I didn't get the connection to picking winners. I got the question, but I didn't understand how you were using the picking winners problem as, could you maybe just, or? Yeah, because you mentioned the, the, the winners have been picked. So if we. Oh, but so have the losers. I mean, everything's been picked. Yeah, but so, so if, we, if we take that as, as sort of, uh, if we accept that also for less developed countries, have they not been sort of picked to be stuck on a low value uh, value creation oh. chain. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm sort of on a global catching up level. How can we think about industrial policy in less developed countries given the fact that they have uh, been pushed towards this acceptance of the neoliberal diktat uh, of uh, yeah. comparative advantage? Sure. And, and, then, and then in that sort of scenario, do we need to rethink uh, the direction argument that we do need to pick winners in these less developed countries? Okay, so the way I was talking about picking winners was within a country. Yeah. Uh, being able to set a broadly defined direction. The last thing you want to do is pick three sectors, right? We're only going to be great at automotive, we're only going to be good at textiles and you know, even rice or whatever, right? The point of the mission was to have a broadly defined problem underneath which you can do lots of different things. Within any of those things, you have portfolios of different areas you're gonna pick, particular firms that you're gonna support over other firms, which by the way is very important in developing countries because it's, uh, this whole small firm thing, and I shouldn't, I, I know people hate me when I say this, but most small companies are crap, right? I mean, it would be fine to, <laughs> sorry, um, especially in the, in, in the UK, um, but in Italy as well. So, you know, you don't just, you don't have policies like let's help small companies because they're important to the economy. Most small companies are small precisely because they're actually not very good. So the whole kind of scaling up issue requires this patient finance, which especially in developing countries has been absolutely fundamental, but that requires picking some companies over other companies. Now that doesn't mean saying, so this then brings us back to the crony capitalist thing, like some companies getting more support than others, whether it's for nepotistic reasons or whatever. There's an issue of can we define certain characteristics that companies must have in order to receive support? And if we start looking at what those characteristics are, they start producing policies that are very different from this kind of catching up and you know, helping small firms or infant industry kind of arguments. Um, but also, to be honest, it's just as true in, de in developed countries, we have not actually been courageous to say we're only gonna have industrial policy or finance policy for particular types of firms. For example, those that are reinvesting their profits in areas like X, Y, and Z. Um, but you're using it in a different way. You're almost using it, I mean, again, develop, development in terms of the development countries, de underdeveloped countries is not my area of expertise, but a great book I read was uh, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. <laughs> and it almost sounds like you're saying, you know, the, the development process itself is an outcome or the lack of development process of certain policies, very strategic policies, having allowed certain countries to develop and certain countries not to develop, and should we talk about the picking winners or, or not allowing certain countries to succeed within this kind of picking winners debate. But you know that's fine, but that kind of stretches the way that we use. Picking winners, I'm only using it to say it's a non-problem. You have to pick. How do we pick? How can we define missions? And then the question is, what are the kinds of missions that are more relevant for a low income, medium income, uh, uh, more developed country, but the, in all of those cases, what you're trying to do is also enable bottom-up processes that engage with this more, you could call it planning or top-down process, but this is where I really think the work of Hirschman or even Danny Roderick and some of his latest work is extremely important for exploration and emergence of, you know, policy as emergence, even though I don't think uh, that work actually explains some of the most important sectors that have come out, so the examples of you know, footballs in Malaysia. Don't do it for me. Sorry, 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's have a second round uh, of questions. Uh, thank you for a very insightful talk. Uh, this is uh, probably not so much a question as a reflection, and then you may want to comment on it. Um, I saw Polanyi referenced on the abstract for this talk, and mm. that's one of the reasons I came. Um, and so with reference to Polanyi and the Polanyian insight about the role of the state in uh, forming and sustaining the market, uh, you mentioned that, but Polanyi also spoke at length about the, the priorities of the human race in terms of habitation versus improvement. Um, and he spoke about the focus on man and his life in society and, and living in harmony with nature. Um, I think Ben and some of the others spoke about the financialization or the commodification of finance aspect. Um, to me, maybe I'm wrong, but to me, some of, uh, some of what was said here doesn't really address any of the fictitious mm. commodification problems from any aspect. Uh, green, so the three aspects of smart, sustainable, and inclusive. Uh, briefly, please. Yeah, I mean, I mean, fictitious commodification of nature, fictitious commodification of land, none of these are really addressed in terms of the, the approach. It seems to me that the role of the state now in the next race is to be an agent for the improvement agenda. Uh, though, though we may call it habitation, some of, the, some of this can be in interpreted as being an agent in the improvement agenda, and it some, somehow ignores the political economy aspect. So one last point was, why would we expect different consequences with respect to sustainability, for example, uh, from, from, from health, public health in the United States, where Americans come to India for medical tourism because they can't afford medical costs anymore in the United States. So why would we expect different results when the social, when the organization of production is going to remain the same? Thank you. Uh, let me ask again, let's try and be brief because we have a time constraint. Sure thing, I'll make this one brief as well. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, this question relates to the insight you provided into the sustainable technologies field. Um, I'm a student here, but I'm also working with a small group, or also defined as a small company actually, um, relating to community-led investments into putting solar panels not only on this roof, but also on other universities in London. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts were about whether there's room for community-led um, technologies and groups and whether they are or aren't conducive to good growth in a national or local level. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions? Any questions? Uh, yes. Hi, Mar Mariana, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question about the political economy of the situation. You mentioned that we are in a discursive crisis, that we don't have enough ideas and arguments about what the public sector could do. I can imagine that now a company like Apple um, would have a great lobbying voice, not least because of its um, economic might. Um, but of course, th such a company has moved beyond its need for um, small company seed funding um, in, 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 uh, and, and has become a giant, and by that means has become disconnected from being part of that contingency that would want politically to lobby the government for the kinds of policies that you're talking about. Mm. So what kinds of sectors and, and um, constituencies of businesses or of people or of communities can we identify that will build the right kind of pressure um, to bring about this change in discourse? Thank you. Any final questions? Yes. Small big. I think we have to be very careful in avoiding that type of dichotomy, mm -hmm. right? Because, he, because there is an inconsistency, right, in the narrative. Because if we want to understand value creation, we need mm. to understand production system. And if, when you start thinking about how a production system really works, there is no big, small. There are different exactly. functions, yeah. and there are certain companies that perform critical functions. I mean, I work a lot in packaging, medical device, and you know, I know the work like at my best, or you know, Chris was referring to, and so on. If we don't understand how this value is generated at that level, we are basically creating again another false dichotomy that yeah. generate again another problem. And this is paradoxical, right? Because in a sense, this is the way in which the neoclassical economists would talk about the small, big, the company that emerge and the other, they disappear. Company don't disappear, they are there, they try to transform, they go through phases where they're being, then become small, and so on and so forth. So I think that's something really that has to be understood. I'll give you just a, a figure. Um, Rolls Royce, uh, which is clearly one of the last big manufacturers here, uh, account in terms of employment less than the Cambridge cluster, which is one of the biggest cluster. And in the Cambridge cluster, apart very few companies that don't produce there, are actually employing more than, than Rolls-Royce altogether. So, and they are generating problem in terms of innovation 
uh, much more than at the moment Rolls Royce is doing, especially when he's threatening the government in terms of going to uh, move their R&D departments to Singapore. As, as you know, this was the main reason why the last government put together four, five, six billion, or what was the, the big plan for the aerospace industrial policy. And they created the NATI, which is the Aerospace Technology Institute, because they had basically to respond to this big request. So I think that's, that should be part of this type of narrative, because otherwise we, we really miss one of the fundamental story. Thank you. And final question, yes. Hi. Um, you discussed inclusive growth, um, and I was just wondering, because you made the um, comment about small firms, um, but I was just wondering if you could kind of elaborate on how if we don't encourage small firms that may not have global empire and huge profits at their core, as soon as this remains at the core, so like TTIP coming through, being pushed through the monopolies, how can we ever have inclusive growth if this is all that you want to actually promote? Yeah. So maybe I'll start with that because I, obviously I, I said it wrong. All I meant was um, I was not trying to say that small firms don't matter. Of course they matter, but they matter in particular contexts. We have to look at what kind of small firms, what kind of relationships with large firms. So for example, um, you know, the whole buyout uh, mania that has occurred in many sectors, including IT and pharma, that in itself is not necessarily a problem. When you are a small firm being bought up by a super financialized firm, that's the problem, right? So what, so Fiat, even in Italy, which had a whole network of small firms around it, those small firms were actually benefit, you know, be, benefiting by interacting with Fiat when Fiat was a functional company that was actually investing in human capital formation and long-run investments. As Fiat in Italy became overly financialized, that network of small firms didn't benefit. So all I'm trying to say is let's focus on the ecosystem of public and private actors, different types of public, and the main thing I've been focusing there is a mission-oriented public sector is very different from one that sees its role as simply facilitating the private sector and the relationships between large and small firms um, rather than focusing on the small firm problem. By the way, the whole financial, um, and this is actually more of an answer, sorry, to you, Antonio, the whole, you know, one of the reforms that were being proposed and is sort of still being enacted around the world after the financial crisis, which was to separate the commercial arm from the investment arm of banks, completely didn't get the small firm problem because small firms, regardless of just you know, the ones who want to innovate or not, small firms require investment. They require patient investment. You don't expect a small firm to go to a commercial bank. So you know, how we have tried and completely failed to reform the financial sector with these very piecemeal uh, reforms versus kind of asking the Minskyan question, what kind of finance do we need in a financial system do we need for real capital development of the economy and what is the role within the capital development of the economy of small firms and their relationship with large firms and what kind of finance do they need, but also in terms of Mushtaq Khan's work, patient finance allowing small firms, for example, to learn, to even have the time to learn, and this is especially true in developing countries, those questions simply have not been asked. So a huge loss, uh, lost opportunity has, I think, happened. Um, the whole power question, which actually was also one of your questions, which I didn't answer, which was the one you were asking. Yeah, you're right, I don't talk about that, I can't talk about everything, however, because I agree, and obviously Polanyi has affected me in all sorts of ways, not just this kind of market shaping stuff, but also the importance of power and politics and uh, the sort of anti kind of movement that he talks about the role of civil society, the, the, the kind of dynamics I've been talking about have absolutely reduced the negotiation, ne negotiating power, if you want, of at least public sector institutions. Don't think of big state, because otherwise we all think of crony capitalist state. I'm literally thinking of local, regional, national organizations, institutions, agencies, many of which are at least in theory dedicated to social programs, whether it be social housing, social education, social health programs. Their ability to negotiate, because it's all about power relationships, there's a, there's a war out there, um, has been massively reduced through this wrong narrative of who the wealth creators are, right? And the fact that, again, the, let me just say the bastardized Keynesians because I don't think that Keynes himself uh, necessarily uh, you know, was guilty of this, but the fact that we haven't in the left had the words or the, literally the theoretical framework to talk about the value creation process itself, 
um, as a result of these kinds of different types of policies has been part of the problem. So it's not just about public choice theory having reduced the power of the public sector to negotiate in these power relationships. Um, sorry, okay, alternative forms of finance. Um, that was you, right? No, who, who did, who asked me about community investment? Yeah, it was you. So, um, one, well, so, you know, even the uh, new forms of finance, which have, I think have especially uh, been, um, how do you say, emerging, especially after the financial crisis because of the disillusion with the status quo on the existing types of finance and also the movements around that, currently, just numbers-wise, are irrelevant. So crowd financing, a little drop in the ocean. Now, does that mean it's irrelevant? No, I mean, quantity-wise, absolutely irrelevant. So in the whole green stuff that I've been looking at, I have the data for every single form of green finance around the world, every single country. Currently, it still tends to be the kind of classic types of finance in both the private and public. However, as, as an alternative, symbolically, form of finance that could potentially, over time, be scaled up, and then the kind of questions that are required and kind of organizations that are required to allow that kind of scaling up process and what that effect would be, that's a very interesting question. And, and a really interesting person to read on this is Roberto Unger, who was the strategic policy guy for Lula. He's also a lawyer and a political scientist at Harvard. He has a very interesting theory about all this, which he talks about in terms of social innovations. So he would actually talk about some of these community investment programs that you're talking about as social innovations. By the way, Minsky and Keynes talked about socialization of investment, which is very interesting, I think, for community investment programs. But anyway, he talks about them as current, you know, that there's a maximalist and a minimalist strategy with these social innovations. And currently, unfortunately, he says, many of these social innovations are living in these little minimalist kind of experiment uh, 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 scenarios where we're not even asking what, it, what would it be like to actually you know, turn these experiments into systems, into the way actually that countries, you know, across different types of these experiments, in some ways, I don't wanna say are run, but you know, allow them to be run by maximalist strategies. And I think this is at least the current problem that I observe is that they remain experiments and they're not even being allowed to be even observed as potential um, ways to really completely change the way that we think about finance. But again, numbers wise, if you look at them, you wouldn't even necessarily study them if you were interested in seeing what kind of finance is really making a wave in um, some of these areas. At the community level, obviously they allow different, anyway. Um, last question, sorry, what was it? What, did I answer them all? Oh, the for, oh, the, the, the other part of your question in terms of the forum, sorry? Okay, let me just ask, say one thing. In, in terms of how can we actually organize to challenge the Apples and the Googles, one issue is it's not enough to have someone like Bill Gates say, you know, the government must lead the way in green. We actually don't have, at least in the business community, and I know this is not the only solution, but this is absolutely fundamental. We don't have a business forum that talks about what is required for future opportunities to actually arise. So given that I'm saying investment is driven by the perception of where the future opportunities are, where is the voice, whether it's in the CBI, the Chambers of Commerce, the Confindustria of this world, that are focusing their dialogue with government in terms of the kinds of public-private interactions, the kind of public investments, private investments, and relationships between them that will allow these future opportunities to even arise. There is literally no business forum, and so um, this, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm name dropping, but Bill Gates recently invited me to spend a whole day with him in Seattle, and he thought I was gonna go there saying, oh yes, we need more government spending in ARPA-E, and I said, do you know what the best thing you could do is actually set up a forum of this nature? Because actually it's not enough to have your AEIC when then your own company is so super financialized. And so the discussion with government should also be about changing the relationship between the public and the private sector, which is incredibly parasitic today. Um, remind me what your, I don't know why, I did, I'm sure I wrote it down. Where did I write it? Can, can you just quickly say what your question was? I mean, I'll remember once you say it. Um, yeah, it was basically just along those lines, um, given that um, by, by merit of becoming a larger com large company, a company like Apple moves beyond the need for small business investment um, funding, uh, or, sm or small business research funding, then it seems that from a polit political economy point of view, um, where, where can we find the kinds of constituencies that will lobby for these policies or that will vote for these policies? Okay, so that's sort of where I was beginning, I guess. I guess I merged the two SME, Antonio's and yours. Um, 
So there's plenty of constituencies and lobbying for uh, the role of, if you want different types of finance to be available to companies that are in their seed stage, you'll never know that they're the future Apple, but you never know, right? Because you know, small, innovative companies don't have any equity, they don't have any history, so where are they gonna get money in a current financial system which is requiring you to prove either existing assets or equity, whatever. So I wouldn't say there's the lack of, lack of that. I think what we lack is what I was mentioning. So, you know, again, I, I give examples of whether it's Israel, which really does have sort of public VC funds, or even Finland, or definitely in Silicon Valley. That itself is, is not what's lacking. What's lacking is this discussion about what is then the proper deal for some of these companies when they do become the Apples or you know whatever the Olivetti's of this world and um, to you know what should their then relationship be with the public system which enabled that uh, growing up right so this role of patient long-term committed finance which is the kind of finance we need is extremely risky why because most of what will be financed will fail. Right? So this is why I ended up with that, which is that what we then need is not just a different discussion of what actually was required for the Facebooks of this world to exist, but also a different type of deal, literally with the profits. So I think there was actually an article this weekend in the New York Times by uh, Dean Baker, who argues that government should just have stock in, in all these companies instead of charging tax. I mean, I'll, you know, I, I think he was building on some of the discussions we had in the past, but I think that kind of misses the point. The point is, you know, there's not just one system. The point is we need, you know, first of all, does the tax system itself provide that sort of return or do we need a different types of ownership structures? This isn't about nationalism, you know, nationalizing companies versus allowing them in the market, but an absolutely different type of relationship with, um, I feel like I'm re repeating myself. Anyway, this whole wealth creation process. So what actually allowed the apples to arise so I think that's a different question from let's set up a bunch of funds which allow seed uh, money to go to small companies. There's, it's not that I don't think that's important, but there's plenty of discussion on that. That's not what we lack today. So I'm not saying it's not an important question. It's luckily a question that is being asked, but it's being asked completely outside of this value creation process. Thank you very much, Mariana. This has been a very, very exciting uh, event uh, and uh, thank you so much for making SOA such an exciting place. Um, thanks Ben uh, for your comments and thanks everyone for coming uh, tonight. The next seminar series, next seminar in the Development Studies Seminar Series is next Tuesday. Professor Uma Kothari, Popular Representations of Development, Creating Global Alliances or Reproducing Inequalities, 5 p.m. in room G3. Uh, and you're more than welcome to come. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mariana. Thank